Let's look at the legendary and giant Chinese two-handed saber known as the Miao Dao and also find out what it has in common and perhaps owes something to in Imperial Prussian cavalry swords. Hi folks, Matt Eaton here, Scholar Gladiator. Now the first thing to say is this review is well overdue. You have seen this sword in the background of my videos for a very, very long time now. And as a general introduction for anyone who doesn't know, this is a particularly iconic and for those in Chinese martial arts famous type of sword called a Miao Dao. Now um, the name Miao Dao is somewhat problematic and complicated and also the history of this sword is somewhat problematic as well. Let's put the scabbard down for a moment. So I'm going to start this video first First of all, with a basic review of this product from LK Chen. Link below to the product, okay? Um, so I'm going to look at this particular example, but then I'm going to dive into the history of the Miao Dao. And the first thing I want to say, I'm going to do the history part later, but the first thing I want to say is um, the the history of this is somewhat um, complicated, also somewhat shrouded in confusion and misinformation. Uh, and to some degree, this type of large Chinese two-handed saber does indeed uh, go back to the Ming Dynasty in one form or another, although not this exact form. And what we see here is really a 20th century sword, and we'll talk more about that later. But now let's look at um, let's look at LK Chen's actual replica here. So this is based on specifications from certain martial arts schools who have been practicing the Miao Dao. Uh, throughout the 20th century. Okay, so this is based on surviving examples that were used by their masters, and this is how this design came about in collaboration with LK Chen. Now, this sword as an, at the outset, the first headlines to say about it is, yes, it is long. Obviously, I'm not going to put the tip on my uh, concrete floor here, but you can see it comes up to the center of my chest. Full measurements, if you check out the link below to LK Chen's website, you can find all of the weight and measurements and everything else there. But despite its size, it is insanely light and fast. This is pretty much the lightest sword of this size that you will ever lay your hands on. You'll also notice that it has very specific um, proportions. It's got a very long hilt. If we just compare it, I'll just pull this um, so-called Zweihander, Montante, Spadone, whatever term you want to use. It's got a very consider um, comparable length hilt. In fact, the hilt is slightly longer on the Miao Dao, but the blade is somewhat shorter, quite a bit shorter, about a foot shorter than the Zweihander. So um, this is a two-handed sword, no question. Um, however, as mentioned, it is a particularly long hilt on it. And whilst it does have a big blade, does have a long blade, it's not insanely long. However, if we're talking about reach, uh, bear in mind that this is a very light weapon. So indeed, you could give uh, cuts or thrusts whereby you let go with one hand and actually use it with the back end here. So if you were going to lance out and thrust at someone, I can easily do that and I could I'm not going to see how long I could stand there because it'll be a really long time, be very boring for you to watch. But this is a really, really light and wieldable sword. The point of balance is also pretty damned close to the um, top of the hilt, um, close to the guard. So it, it, it's just crazy light and crazy, crazy quick. Now um, I'm not going to show you me. Uh, I'm not going to show you me cutting uh, with this sword, quite simply because I lack the materials at the moment to do decent cutting tests. Um, but what we're going to see on screen here is this is LK Chen cutting himself with the sword, and as you can see, this thing performs absolutely excellently. Now the question is, why is this sword? so light. Uh, why is it so uh, so long and so light uh, for its, uh, you know, why is it so nimble for its size? And it comes down to one very simple factor, and that is the blade cross-section. So if we look at the blade cross-section here, those of you who are familiar with 19th century British swords will hopefully quickly recognize this as a pipe-backed blade. Now we're going to talk more about the possible origins of the pipeback blade, but strengths and weaknesses. I've talked about pipeback blades in many videos looking at antique swords in my own collection and ones that have passed through my business. And the advantages, the massive advantage of a pipeback blade is that it's light. Okay. The disadvantages is that it can be less durable, particularly the edge, because you have a very uh, thin 
uh, edge section down here. Um, so this is sometimes known as the keyhole or latchet um, cross section of blade. So we essentially have a round back section at the blunt back, round section here, and then a very thin narrow wedge, which means that you've got quite a narrow edge angle and you can have a very, very fine sharp edge, but it's not a particularly, uh, rope. there's not an awful lot of metal behind the edge. I have to say, Given that this is a large sword, this is thicker than a typical British officer's one-handed sword would be. So it's got a fair amount of metal behind the edge still, and it's comparable with certain types of hollow ground uh, medieval swords that we might find, for example. The other advantage, uh, sorry, disadvantage of pipe back blades is that they can be considered rather flexible for their length. But I have to say again, because this is a big two-handed sword, this is not especially flexible. Um, it's not like wobbly or floppy uh, like some pipe backs can be. Essentially because a decent amount of uh, uh, thickness in the cross section has been left in the flats of the blade. So not only do we have a rod section, but we've still got a relatively decent wedge section. It's not completely flat uh, in the cut and portions of the blade. Now, in terms of reviewing this actual product, like all LK Chen swords, it is made to perform, it's made to cut, it's made to be used. This is not a wall hanger, it is a real sword made traditionally by craftsmen in Long Quan, and it is hand forged. Um, this is particularly made for modern martial arts practitioners, so it actually has stainless steel, I believe, um, hilt fittings, both the guard and the uh, ferrule in there, and the pommel cap. Uh, it's not really a pommel as such, but um, butt cap, uh, hilt end. This cap at the end here is also stainless steel. So they're not going to rust and you can use them um, continuously in practice without having to worry about rust forming on them. The blade, however, is carbon steel. They come with a few different blade options as most LK Chen swords do, but they're carbon steel and obviously heat treated, um, hardened and tempered and sharpened, designed for cutting um, practice for in your martial arts training. Um, so it's an incredibly uh, light and nimble sword. It's made of good functional materials. The wood of the grip is very nicely um, finished and it is pinned into places. Now, let's, oh, and the scabbard as well also has uh, traditional uh, stainless, well, traditional style fittings, but in stainless steel. So it's the marriage of kind of modern uh, metallurgy and uh, kind of um, not having to worry about rusting essentially, um, but nevertheless with a wooden scabbard. And the whole thing is incredibly uh, robustly made, as I say, very much made to be used. Um, and it sits very well in the scabbard. There's no, there's no vibrations or uh, rattles or anything like that. It's, as you can see, it does wobble a fair amount as all long blades do, uh, but the vibrational node is very close to where you'd expect, well, it is where you'd expect the center of percussion to be. So functionally, a fantastic sword. Now, let's get back to the issue of the history of this sword and also the ambiguity about its origins. So, if we go all the way back into the Ming Dynasty, so now, when, for those of you who don't know, the Ming Dynasty, we're essentially talking about in Europe what would have been the late Middle Ages and uh, into the Renaissance, okay? Now, during the Ming Dynasty, there were various things going on in China, uh, militarily and historically. One of those things was that the um, various Chinese, were having, the Chinese rulers were having to deal with um, Japanese piracy and indeed Chinese piracy and and other issues so but during particularly in, in reference to this type of sword um, during the Ming Dynasty they encountered Japanese um, warriors um, you know sometimes just bandits pirates sometimes Ronin but they encountered them and particularly um, were impressed by the no dachi okay so that is the large version of the Japanese uh, warrior's two-handed sword, so bigger than a katana, bigger than a tachi, um, uh, essentially about the size of this. Now, this is this is something which is difficult to pin down. There's not a huge number of written sources. Um, what I'm going to do is I am going to link you below to a website which uh, which will call Kung Fu Tea, which will um, explain in far more detail the possible ancestry of the Miao Dao. But in a nutshell, during the Ming Dynasty, there was something called the Dan Dao, which essentially means um, single sword or single saber, I believe, which um, designates the fact that it was used by itself without an offhand weapon, such as a, a shield or another sword or whatever. Um, so it was used by itself 
and therefore was known as the single sabre. Um, dao meaning, we translate it roughly as, it can mean knife as well, but we translate it single edged sword. For the purposes of this, we'll translate it as sabre. So, there was the dandao. Now, the dandao has a particular um, subdivision, shall we say, of the uh, changdao, as I understand it. And the changdao is something which comes about specifically emulating. Uh, large Japanese nodachi, okay, so large Japanese swords. So in the Ming Dynasty, without getting too caught up in the terminology and all the different types of dao that we see uh, in period texts, um, the in the modern world, usually the dan dao or the chang dao, and those, can, those to some degree can be used interchangeably, in the Ming Dynasty comes about as a response to large Chinese swords and is used by some troops and is shown in some treatises, some Chinese uh, martial arts treatises of, of the, I think, 17th century. Um, and is, is shown being used and it is a large saber superficially similar to this. However, if we actually look at the Ming Dynasty examples, there are some design differences between this Miao Dao here and the Ming examples. And in fact, LK, LK Chen is, has subsequently looked at the, the um, replicas of the Ming Dynasty types. This Miao Dao is replicating essentially 20th century descendants of those Ming Dynasty two-handed swords that survived in martial arts training. Okay, so the Miao Dao really should be viewed as a 20th century sword, but it is a descendant of the Ming Dynasty and Qing Dynasty two-handed swords that went before it. Now, with the uh, Ming Dynasty swords, the big difference between those and this is that this in particular has a pipe back blade. Now, one of the great questions that uh, me talking with um, LK and the people who work at LK Chen was, where did this pipe back blade come from? Because if we look at the Ming Dynasty uh, Dan Dao or Chang Dao, then we don't see this type of pipe back blade. Now, what's interesting is, although it's lost in the mists of time and we don't yet know the answer, we haven't found written sources, we haven't found anyone who knows for certain, it appears that the pipe back blade came into Chinese sword design around the year 1900. Now, things were interesting things were happening around this time, of course, because there was a uh, cultural military revolution in China at the beginning of the 20th century. And one of the groups of people who were involved in facilitating the mechanization of the Chinese military system and, you know, the changes in their uniforms, their rifles and the swords that they carried were... Um, European officers and advisors, and particularly Prussians. Now, this is very, very interesting. So initially, I came at this Miao Dao and talking with uh, KK, who works at El Kitchen, I was like, you know, where does this pipe back come from? I've never seen a pipe back blade on old Chinese swords before, but I'm completely familiar with pipe back blades on, um, on British swords. So here is a British example. This is actually an East India Company sword. And you'll notice it's got a very nice um, Prosser made, Prosser, very good maker of the time, pipe back blade. So exactly like the Miao Dao, it has a rod section at the back, and then it has a very narrow or flat section, wedge section for the rest of the blade. Just like with the Miao Dao, this makes for a very light, very responsive blade. However, in British service, these were found to be not as um, durable and strong as the later fuller type of blade. Well, the type of fuller blade that replaced it. In actual fact, that type of fuller blade had been around before as well, so it wasn't a new invention. So this type of fullered, um, this type of pipe back blade passed out of British service around 1845, 1846 in official usage. Obviously, they still remained in use for a few years after that, but in terms of manufacturing. So we're talking about the middle of the 1800s. So if they disappear in British service in the middle of the 1800s, why are the Chinese using them after 1900? Well, that's where the Prussians get involved. So bizarrely, despite the fact that the British seem to have if not invented, I think the French probably, with uh, right at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, um, were experimenting with an official model that um, it was in brief service that had a pipe back blade. But the British additionally had been experimenting with pipe back blades in the early 1800s in the Napoleonic Wars, in the second half of the Napoleonic Wars. But despite the fact that the British and the French 
pushed them out of service well before the middle of the 19th century. For some reason, around the middle of the 19th century and, and in the couple of decades after, various countries, including Prussia, Prussia um, and Switzerland, um, decided that they were going to start using pipe back blades. Now, in a sense, this has always been one of the great mysteries of m European military sword uh, technology, so I say, or design, even politics to an extent, of the 19th century. Why? When Britain and France had got rid of pipeback blades, why did sometime very soon after that, certain countries, Prussia, Switzerland, to some degree Austria, and occasionally Italy, why did they start using pipeback blades? Because the problems of pipeback blades, well, the advantages and the disadvantages, hadn't changed. And we don't know the answer. I've never seen a written text. Maybe someone who's working with German sources Austro-Hungarian, Swiss, maybe they'll find something written one day which explains why they adopted pipe back blades. Anyway, what we've got here is a, I believe it's a non-commissioned officer's um, a cavalry sword of 1889 pattern. And you will notice straight away that it has a pipe back blade. And indeed, this type of sword was still being used in the First World War. Um, and it's got a blade very similar to certain Swiss swords as well. You'll notice it has a raised, what's called Yelman, um, with a, the rod section carries up the point, so it ends up with the spear point, quite good for thrusting. And then it has the rod at the back and this cross section, exactly like the Miao Dao. The point is different, but the edge section exactly the same. So. Our current working theory, um, and we've got pictures, of course, from China around 19, well, after 1900, the early, early 20th century. We've got pictures of Chinese soldiers wearing Prussian-inspired, and sometimes French, but usually Prussian-inspired uniforms, carrying Prussian-inspired swords. In one case here, you can even see to see this characteristic 1889 style uh, finger rest in there. You can actually see that in one of these pictures. So these were, and we also know that the Prussians were not only giving them ideas about the design of their uniforms and equipment and everything else, they were also making it. So the Chinese were importing German swords made for the most part in Solingen straight into China and using them in their military. So it's my current hypothesis, and KK LKHN agrees with this as well, um, that this is the, my current working theory, and we need more data really to make sure that this, this actually stands up, but my current working theory is that the Chinese military in the first couple of decades of the 20th century, so between about 1900 after the so-called Be Boxer Rebellion and then up till about 1920, they had adopted huge amounts of German equipment, and so when they came to either revive or update or continue the use of the two-handed sword in martial arts schools, they went to the pipe back blade because they had become familiar with the pipe back blade from Prussian, particularly cavalry, but sometimes infantry swords um, uh, as well, so, uh, that they basically copied that cross-sectional blade design so that they could have a very large blade that was very, very light. Now, I have to caveat that. Because we don't have a huge amount of data to go on at the moment, this is a working theory, it is possible that they this was convergent evolution and that sometime in the 19th century, independent of British or Prussian or whoever else uh, interference in China, that they came up with the Miao Dao pipe-backed um, blade section by themselves. However, I think that it's I think that it's unlikely given the evidence that we have. And equally, um, people like Peter Decker who deal in Chinese swords, I have not seen uh, any Chinese swords from before 1900 which have a pipe-backed cross section to them. And especially so, I haven't seen any pipe back cross section blades from the Ming Dynasty, for example, on a Dandao or Changdao. So I don't think that we should always, particularly with this form of Miao Dao, which has a pipe back blade, I don't think we should always exactly equate it with the old Ming Dynasty two handed saber. I think they, it's a descendant of it but it's not the exact same sword. So to conclude, this form of the Miao Dao, which is based on examples which have been used in training for at least the last hundred years in China, 
I believe is essentially a 20th century martial weapon and to some degree they were you know carried in the conflicts of the 20th century and uh, it is a descendant of the Ming Dynasty two-handed saber but it is not the same thing and it continued to develop and I think that it also tells an interesting story and for those of you who are not aware of it of how Europe's military influenced Chinese traditional martial practices and in the Chinese military through their hardware and other things in the 20th century and it's a very interesting facet of history to look into. So there we go, LK Chen's uh, Miao Dao, an amazingly light and fluid moving, quick, long, uh, nimble weapon, an incredible thing in the hand. I don't think you'll ever hold another sword that feels exactly like this ever, I certainly haven't. Um, not exactly the same as a Ming or Qing Dynasty two-handed saber, well it's late Ching, uh, but not the same as a Ming Dynasty two-handed uh, Dan Dao or Chang Dao, but a descendant of it that perhaps, and perhaps even probably, has some European input in its design, and yet is still part of traditional Chinese martial arts to this very day. I hope that's been interesting. Uh, give us a like and a subscribe, and I will check out the links below, of course, um, for more information on this topic. But I will see you back on the channel really, really soon. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.